light on if you like. That's good. Good. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I'm Andrea Packard, and I'm honored to introduce tonight's speaker, Donald Teske. His lecture and List Gallery exhibition uh, are the culmination of a three-week residency here at Swarthmore, where he's been out painting in the Crumb Woods and working in Beardsley alongside our students and faculty, and we've been very enriched by his presence, his inspiring art, and his kindness. Um, so I'm really honored to be here with him tonight as he talks about his work to you. Uh, these events and a color catalog that's out in the gallery and is free have been made possible by the William J. Cooper Foundation. And if you don't know, the William Cooper Foundation brings artists and other individuals to campus here at Swarthmore who are preeminent in their field. We're very grateful to Cooper and also to a num number of other individuals who've made these events possible. Uh, notably, I'd like to thank Margot Dolan, uh, who is co-founder of the Ballin Glen Arts Foundation and also uh, director of Dolan Maxwell here in Philadelphia, which represents Donald uh, Teske in the United States. Um, and I'd like to thank her colleagues, Ron Rumford and John Eckel, who helped with a lot of the logistics of borrowing works. Uh, I'd also like to thank a couple of individuals from Swarthmore, including Professor of Art uh, Randall Exon, who first brought uh, Donald Teske's work to our attention, and um, to my wonderful colleagues, uh, Betsy Hinsey and Meg Gebhardt and Doug Heron, who always help so much with the installations, as well as um, my wonderful interns, uh, Maral Guyany and Elizabeth Whipple, Blake Oding and Zena Wang. Uh, they've um, prepared a wonderful feast for us afterwards, so I hope you'll stay and have refreshments afterwards. Um, most of all, we want to thank Donald Teske, uh, who, as you may know, is one of Ireland's most preeminent artists. Uh, his works have been exhibited throughout the world, including in China, Finland, France, Germany, uh, South Africa, Canada, as well as the United Kingdom. And he's, uh, his work is held in distinguished collections um, throughout the world. And there's a long list in the catalog in the gallery, so I hope you'll look at the details there. But just to name a few, his, he's exhibited his work often at the Royal Hibernian Academy in Dublin, the National Gallery of Ireland, and the Irish Museum of Modern Art. In 2006, he was awarded membership in OSDANA, which recognizes superior contributions to the arts in Ireland. And also, he is a member of the Royal Hibernian Academy in Dublin. But for me, the reason his work is important and of such note, and it's such an honor to install it here at Swarthmore, a small portion of his art, um, it's because it really helps us see the world in new ways. And whether his artworks position us on top of a cliff um, or on the fractured rocks at the sea's edge, confronted by an oncoming wave, we feel when we're looking at them that something is about to happen, something momentous, something seismic, perhaps. And as we look at them and the way the land dissolves into sea and sea dissolves back into the air, we were kind of reminded of our own capacity for change, our own capacity for transformation and renewal. I think his, um, his artworks also are powerful because they display alongside those metaphors and themes tremendous virtuosity that we can all learn from. And as you'll see, working with large trowels and palette knives, uh, he's really known as a, a painter's painter, someone who explores the elasticity of painting and um, its expressive capacity in, in its widest range. And so viewers who go into the List Gallery, maybe you know his work from, from other exhibitions, and recognize its, its uh, distinctive thick textures and incised layers, um, you, might, you might be surprised to find that he first gained recognition um, after graduating from uh, the Limerick College of Art 
in uh, 1978, he first gained recognition for his finely detailed pencil drawings. Um, in fact, uh, he drew for, he almost exclusively drew for nearly a decade. And this practice of drawing uh, really uh, honed his discipline, his capacity for revision, and his mastery of tone in a way that really continues to inform his paintings. And I think that you see in his paintings uh, the hand of a draftsman. Uh, his drawings also uh, early on captured the zeitgeist of Dublin in the early 1980s. They were beautifully and crafted, but they also captured a sense of absence and alienation, um, which of course is the legacy of Ireland's long history of colonization and strife, emigration and famine. And uh, in, in 1984, the, uh, the well-known art historian Lucy Lepard recognized in his work this ability to capture a, a larger cultural milieu, and she included him in a major traveling exhibit called uh, Divisions, Crossroads, Turns of Mind, Some New Irish Art. And that was just one of many accolades he received as a young man, but luckily for everybody, he wasn't fettered by success, as so many are, um, and he continued to engage with students and challenge himself as, as well as them um, by upending his own habits. Um, and as a result, his prolific 39-year career, uh, which unfortunately we don't have space to show you in the List Gallery, but he can share with you tonight, it, it includes many uh, different media, including drawing, paint make, uh, printmaking, watercolor, and even uh, illustration. And this range and scope of his work has really been informed by numerous, not just these accolades, but long-term artist residencies that he's pursued all over the world, most recently at Swarthmore, luckily enough for us. Um, his first residency was in 1995 at the Tyrone Guthrie Center, Anna McCarrig, and he subsequently uh, pursued longer stays at, uh, in County Cork, at, at uh, the Vermont Studio Center, at the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation in Connecticut, um, sponsored residencies in Venice and in France, but uh, Paris, but perhaps the most important residency that he pursued um, was his 1990 Six day at the Ballin Glen Arts Foundation, uh, which many people here may be familiar with. Um, it is in Northern uh, Ireland, not Northern Ireland, but the north of the Republic of Ireland, North. Northwest, and um, in County Mayo. And uh, he was inspired by the large creative community of artists who've, who were there and uh, returned over the years, contributing to an ongoing creative dialogue that's been international and intergenerational. In fact, many of our students have traveled there for summer study and become part of this larger dialogue. And so like many Ballin Glen fellows, he was surrounded by dramatic landscape, but he often felt he was not painting just the landscape so much as the sudden shifts in weather, those liminal moments I was talking about earlier. Because um, Mayo is still very largely free of um, tourism, and so its craggy rocks and rough seas and its towering cliffs provide a, an experience of the sublime that is increasingly rare. And so as a result, um, although his career has really spanned so many um, themes, ideas, and subjects, and media, um, we've honed in here on these sublime works in the List Gallery, works that are primarily from County Mayo and works um, that speak to our capacity for transformation and transcendence. I'm glad tonight that you can see that, but also um, glimpse the much larger and more fascinating story of his long career. Um, an artist that we all have been privileged to work with. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Donald Teske. Thank you very much, Andrea. Um, uh, <clears throat> you must excuse my voice tonight. I'm a bit, uh, bit hoarse, but uh, we'll get through it. Um, 
I want to thank Andrea uh, in particular for inviting me to come and show here in the list and also to spend some time uh, <clears throat> working in the, uh, in the, the environment of, of Swarthmore College. It was, uh, it's been a real pleasure to meet, um, to meet the students and, uh, and so many wonderful staff as well who've all been marvellous to me. So um, I've had three weeks working here already and my time is nearly up, so I'm going to miss it, actually. Um, I, I feel I've only been getting started, of, of course. Um, but that's always the way, you know. But I'm very fortunate to have a studio as well while I've been working here, and, uh, and I've made some work. And I look at it when I get back to Ireland and see, you know, how meaningful it is and whether I can do anything with it subsequently. But um, so tonight, uh, I'm just going to take you through my career. I'll start a little bit about how I, you know, uh, about um, growing up, about my ancestors and why I ended up in County Limerick, um, Limerick's College of Art, School of Art and Design, and, uh, and moving to Dublin and then subsequent uh, introduction to the idea of residencies as a way of focusing on, on work, um, bodies of work. And I've always liked to I have found it so uh, important to kind of be able to get away from your day-to-day -day studio life and spend some time in an environment. And uh, what I found is I, I'm able to respond very well to the place I'm in at any one, any particular time, I suppose, such as here, you know. It takes time to kind of to familiarise yourself with what's around you, um, but it... Uh, once I start working, I'm able to, to, um, to find connections and make paintings based on those. So uh, the image on the screen is um, one, of the, uh, one of my interesting detours that I've taken in my work over the years. It's, uh, it's from a print studio, pub print publishers that I work in. And what you see on the screen are all the proofs hanging like tea towels or laundry, you know, drying. Um, but I'll get to that later on. So um, to start at the beginning, I'm going to give you a little map of Ireland so you can get your bearings, OK? <clears throat> and uh, OK, Dublin, that's where I live. Uh, Cork, County Cork, we have some paintings in the ex exhibition from this area. Uh, West Cork in particular, which is uh, very beautiful. Um, uh, and very different to North Mayo, which is the other area where I've worked quite uh, extensively over the years. And we also have Connemara, which is this area here, uh, centred on Clifton. And, um, and Castle Matrix, that's where I grew up. So <clears throat> the significance of that is, uh, I suppose, um, uh, my ancestors were German Palatines who came to Ireland in 1709. Um, and some of you might know that many German Palatines also came to Pennsylvania at the same time. Uh, there were several thousand that came to Pennsylvania. But, uh, <clears throat> but some, some of the Palatines were redirected, redirected to Ireland uh, to bo bolster the Pro Protestant numbers, because they were Lutherans. Um, so my ancestors arrived in County Limerick, in this place called Castle Matrix. Um, and this is County Limerick. So um, mostly farmers, winemakers, and craftsmen, craftspeople. Um, and my father was a, a carpenter, a joiner, and subsequently a builder, and, a, and worked in construction. And we lived in that area of Castle Matrix right up to only a few years ago when all the Teskies have now left. But, so this is Castle Matrix. Um, it's, uh, uh, it was the home of a Lord Southwell who provided his lands to the German Palatines when they arrived. Um, so the significance of, of that is that uh, because a, a we were Protestants, and we and they eventually converted to Methodist. 
I was sent to a boarding school in Dublin, which was a Methodist boarding school. And um, I was perfectly all right with that uh, because it brought me to Dublin. And even though I was incarcerated in a boarding school, I was also able to escape and go out and see the city. And, uh, and I explored, uh, of course, what 14-year-olds can do and so on in the city. I was very interested in music and also uh, managed to find the National Gallery. And, um, but it was really back in County Limerick where when I re returned during the summer that I was more interested in art. And my parents were very supportive. And we had a creative environment, even though my parents weren't artists, but they were very interested in the fact that I showed signs of being able to draw and they, were, and they supported that very well. And so when it came to saying, actually, uh, no, I don't want to be an architect, I want to be an artist, um, that uh, they uh, took that on board. And, but unfortunately, the early 1970s was um, a time of economic crash, uh, global crash, actually oil crisis. And my parents, my father's uh, construction business went bankrupt. And so we ran out of money. And so when I should have been going to National College of Art and Design, I went to Limerick School of Art and Design instead. But that proved to be actually quite a, you know, um, a good thing in the sense that it was a small enough college, but it also interacted very well with um, other colleges and students from there would often interchange, you know, miraculously. It's probably something that you don't do now, you know. But this is just an example of work that I was doing in art college. Uh, it's not probably one of the most significant pieces, but it's the only one I had a photo of because it belongs to my sister and she has it in our house. So, um, but it was, uh, you know, I, I was exploring um, uh, form and shape. And, you know, the biggest influence on my work was not landscape as such. I used to travel to New York as a student um, because I was working in Canada picking tobacco, of all things. And we made lots of money. And it was through, through picking tobacco that I was able to put myself through art college. And, um, and I did that for several years. But of course, it, it allowed me to visit Mama and the Met. And, and of course, I was able to see firsthand back in the 1970s what, what the abstract expressionists were all about, what our hard edge painting was about. Um, as well as, uh, as the, the vast range of, of contemporary art uh, that is on show and still is. And it's funny, it's always like deja vu. Every time I return to the Met or even to Mama, you know, I have flashbacks of what it was like in those years back in 1974, 75, 76. And of course, the city back then as well was like stepping into a movie scene, like something like Taxi Driver or something like that. And, and, but cities were like that. Limerick was like that. Um, so was Dublin. Um, one of my uh, tutors in college, who was a visiting artist, he was a young artist, but his name is Char Charles Tyrrell, and we, we did call him Charlie Tyrrell. Um, but his, um, his, uh, his work had that uh, connection to landscape, even though it, it was conceptual, it was austere, it, uh, and it still is, and, um, and minimalist. Uh, but he made me or in a sense, it prompted me to look at my, look at the landscape and my environment and find, try and find my own voice to express it. Um, and uh, rather than always kind of looking elsewhere. So, um, and I took that on board in a sense, I don't think necessarily he told me to do that, but that's what I took out of it when I was uh, approaching my final year in college. And so I started a series of drawings um, which uh, explored what I felt was uh, exploring my own environment. Um, and these are pencil on paper. And Andrea mentioned those in the, uh, the introduction. And so this series of drawings was taking um, elements of, of, I suppose, the, the, the hard edge forms um, and introducing them into an organic uh, um, environment. And these are quite large, well, relatively large drawings for pencil drawings, I suppose. And as I moved to Dublin, 
which I did in 1979, I uh, immediately kind of felt, I, the landscape was just, uh, the environment was extraordinary and the landscape, the, the urban landscape was quite derelict um, in places. And I responded to that and made these drawings. And throughout the, um, throughout the 1980s, I had quite a sort of a surprising success with those drawings, having several exhibitions and, and uh, being curated for exhibitions and so on. But um, by the, by, as time went on, uh, 1989, I'd, um, I was already in this uh, studio, a group studio, uh, which was the first of its kind in the city, actually, a cooperative studio. I was there with eight, eight other artists. And we, um, uh, we, uh, <clears throat> I suppose we, you know, it was a cheap, it was a cheap uh, studio space and, and my peers were all exploring their own work, mostly painters. But um, I was having a crisis uh, in my work in the sense I was at a period of transition and I needed to move the work forward. And um, I was invited to, by a book publisher, to, uh, to, you know, to see if I was interested in, in illustrating, in providing some drawings for a book that they were doing. At that time in Ireland, uh, the government was pumping more money into into publishing, especially for children's books, and um, and so for me it was a way uh, of helping me to support my family because there was money in it, and uh, which was great. So uh, and which was necessary, um, and so I kind of reluctantly agreed to do it because being a fine artist, the idea of going into this other field of kind of design was a you know could be viewed upon as being somewhat like selling out, you know, um, a little bit. Uh, so I was a bit uh, cautious of it, but uh, nevertheless, I decided to try it. And I took this approach. This book, by the way, is called Under the Hawthorne Tree, as you can read there, by Marita Conlon McKenna. And it was, um, it was the first book of its kind to, <clears throat> to tell a story about the Irish famine for children, for young readers. And uh, I approached it by making these small little uh, drawings, um, which somehow echoed kind of period engravings, but actually were also not anything of the kind. They were actually drawn on acetate with felt pen. And I used um, isopropyl alcohol to dissolve and to push the uh, medium around. But the end result was um, these, these little chapter headings. And so, um, so they help tell the story in a purely, a quite a simple visual um, way. Uh, I was, um, unfortunately, I, well, not unfortunately, but I was surprised and the book actually became an international best, bestseller. And it's, in, it's probably translated into about uh, 15 languages or more now, so, um, including Swahili. And the whole subject of the Irish famine is one that uh, resonates, I think, with many many people. Um, and the Irish famine, for those of you who don't know much about it, happened in 18, in the mid, mid 18, um, 1800s, around 1848, and caused de devastation, um, halved the population of Ireland at the time, which, and it's never recovered from it, um, which is why it's only about six million today. But uh, so, it's a, it, and the famine still resonates in Ireland. But anyway, it also led me back to painting because uh, the amount of work I put into illustration, I actually discovered it was almost like painting. And, uh, and I took that time then just to, just, to, um, just to connect with paint again. And, uh, and I was offered a solo show in Dublin, my first solo show of paintings. And uh, even before I'd made any paintings, so I, I like to put myself under pressure, I guess, you know. <laughs> but they uh, were confident that I could do it, so um, I did. Now, this necessarily isn't the work that I showed then, but it was the work that evolved 
uh, subsequently in the early 1990s. And uh, very urban, but dark and kind of um, still showing, I think, uh, still sort of, still somewhere in that area of my drawing and even those illustrations, um, tona tonal wise and so on. But I was exploring the, the landscape of Ireland, the, city, the urban landscape. And I suppose the other thing too is when I started back painting, I, um, I was kind of reluctant to start painting with a brush. Um, I'd always use drawing materials and so I felt that uh, I was more, I was, I found more, um, I was more engaged when I was able to actually touch the canvas with, you know, the implement that I was using rather than with a brush, which somehow distances you from the surface. Uh, something about that pressure, you know, that haptic sense, if I dare use that um, word, uh, of touching the canvas was um, something that I felt important. And also the implements that I was using, the trowel that I eventually came to use as a kind of favorite go-to uh, implement, uh, reminded me of drawing with large blocks of charcoal and, and so on. It, um, so these paintings are all from around the studio where I lived, that same studio, Great Strand Street, in the centre of Dublin. Um, And it was around 1996, it was 1996, when, uh, when there was a call out from the uh, Ballant Glen Arts Foundation for people who were interested to, uh, to visit. So I said, yes, I think I could do that. You know, I could try it. And myself and my family, and we had two small children at the time, went to, um, went to, Ballin went to North Mayo. So this was my first real involvement with um, with landscape as such. And I was hesitant at first because I think the first year I went in 96, I, um, I really just focused on the village and the buildings and so forth because that's what we felt comfortable with. But the following year, I started looking at the sea for the very first time. Somehow I found a, I don't know, I found a way of, of looking at it and um, and, and working uh, through drawings that I was working on as well, using a sketchbook mostly, um, even using a video camera, an old Canon camera that didn't really allow you to look back at it. So, uh, but it sort of helped me to capture some of the motion, um, the agitation that was pre ever present in that landscape. Um, I traveled to West Cork then subsequently and uh, started looking at the architecture around the coast. So piers, uh, seaside buildings and so on, using a sketchbook as my primary source and then working in, on, in the studio um, on larger scale paintings. I wasn't painting plain air at that stage. That was to come a lot later. But my but uh, sketchbook I found endlessly useful um, in that it provided me with a way of selecting out, selecting just the information I needed in the painting, just enough information to work on. Um, and a camera I rarely used at all. And so back in Dublin I started to explore the uh, urban landscape, come reaching. Uh, the economy was starting to boom in Ireland uh, at the end of the 1990s, and um, construction started to, uh, uh, you know, be ever present in the um, urban landscape. Um, and so uh, it became an interesting subject for me to paint. This painting is called Black Rock, Rock Public Baths, and it's a disused swimming pool, outdoor swimming pool, beside a 
public um, suburban rail station. Um, I was very interested in the uh, just those combinations, a compositional device of the uh, almost white on one side, divided down the center, black on the other side. Um, this is also a seaside town, Bray, County Dublin, from the early 2000s. And again, the symmetry and geometry of the uh, architecture is the uh, main subject. Here, the, um, here we come to Dublin Docklands, and it's, um, this is where the, the, uh, the old buildings were being wiped away, and all that was being uh, remained um, as the construction continued were the listed buildings. Um, so our buildings with interesting facades, the old chimney stacks, and so on. and U2's building in the background. Um, <clears throat> and like this one, the, this picture is divided down the center um, with uh, the shadow line. So I was, uh, I, I, it's, it's something I've always tried to kind of do in the painting is do sort of impossible compositions or compositions which you're told not to do, you know, as a student, right? So, um, and uh, so, there are always ways and means of breaking rules successfully. And likewise with this one. So these are quite large paintings, actually. This, this one is it's quite a large canvas. Um, but I felt I was getting very, you know, I was really taking off or, you know, I was getting very into painting. You know, so I, so just to remind myself not to get carried away, I started drawing again as well. Um, so I, I made these drawings um, and, and numerous drawings as well at the same time. Um, the opportunity to do a, a, a residency in Vermont game when I won a, res, a fellowship, uh, which I had applied for and was given a month in Vermont, which was uh, between those seasons, you know, it wasn't winter and it wasn't summer, so, but it was, this thaw was going on all the time, and the snow and, and ice thawing out and then freezing again, and it was terrific. Um, so I worked quite small, <clears throat> these are quite um, works on paper, work in acrylic, I did, I'd, although all the previous work you've seen were, was in oil on canvas. Uh, it was when I started, um, when I visited Vermont really that I started using acrylic and discovered gold in acrylics, of course, um, which were, on, were there in supply and I never looked back really. I found them to be uh, certainly amongst the best I've used. So these things are all are significant, of course, you know. But anyway, so uh, I know that Vermont uh, can look very beautiful in the summer and, and autumn, but I just found it beautiful, amazing in, at this time of year in, in, early, in spring, early spring, April, I think. And I mean, I was fascinated because the Christmas de decorations were still up. It was very muddy and scrappy. So <clears throat> I think I got completely the wrong impression of the place, apparently, because uh, it is very beautiful, uh, very quite pretty. So. Um, And so back to Mayo, I started uh, my encounter with um, artists who may, came from the States, mainly Philadelphia. Um, artists who were quite adept at painting in plain air introduced me to the whole concept of working outside because there wasn't really a tradition of plain air painting in Ireland. The, condition, the weather isn't that, you know, suited to it. It's, you know, you gotta be, people give up. In any case, I was always, I felt I was a studio painter. I brought my sketches back to the studio and worked. So, uh, but the conditions in, in Mayo, you know, when you find a good day, I, it's a very remote landscape. It's a very remote environment. Tourists traditionally don't go there, which is fantastic. Not fantastic for the people who live there. I think they could do with more tourists visiting and, and they're trying, you know. 
But even if you look at the tourist guides and the maps, they, um, they send you from Ackle Island, which is in the lower part of Mayo, across to, you know, and across to the Sligo or somewhere, completely missing um, that corner of, of Mayo. And that's okay because um, as artists, it's uh, the County Mayo, it's the kind of uh, landscape, it's the environment that um, really allows you to explore your own work. It's not, it doesn't impose the kind of iconic scenic view which has been captured by postcards, you know, for, for decades or centuries even. It's, a, it's got a raw, elemental, beautiful landscape that takes time for it to seep into your consciousness and then you never leave it, you know, it doesn't leave you. Um, and the Ballon Glen Arts Foundation, as, uh, uh, as Andrea was mentioning earlier, has a unique model in that it allows families to go. You go on your own, of course, and most artists do. But if you have a small family, if you have a family, a young family, it uh, accommodates them, and that's very unique. And, uh, and of course, they're amazing with people there. And so is the whole community as well. It's, um, it has, uh, you get to know all the people in the area, or a lot of them, and uh, many become friends. And so, which is why many artists return time and time again. But for me, I was exploring the coastline at this stage again, returning, play, painting, painting many plain air paintings. Um, and developing that, that uh, range of skill sets that re is required to work outdoors. Um, I mean, these are in the studio, this one is in studio painting, but <clears throat> this followed a very large scale exhibition in uh, Limerick City Gallery of Art, which is a museum space in Limerick City. Um, and uh, I was able to produce some very large scale work for that show based on my visits to Mayo and the work that I made there. So these are all canvas, oil and canvas. And this is a, this is in the Luxman Gallery, a university um, in Cork, University College Cork. It's, um, it's like here, a college gallery. And that's a Limerick City Gallery of Art, a, a large canvas. This is a, measures 14 feet by eight. Still, it's still the largest canvas I've made. Um, there isn't really a much, uh, much of a demand for such large canvases in Ireland or, or the place to show them regularly. So, uh, but it was a wonderful to have the opportunity to work on such a large scale. Um, and then I made this large suite of drawings as well, uh, which I showed in Dublin subsequently. Again taking the, the rocks and the geology of the coastline in North Mayo, which is very specific. It has a very specific geology, which is why I keep responding to it. And other parts of Ireland don't share that same, same type of rock, which is limestone. And it shatters and breaks up into, into fragments and, create, and creates a kind of architecture. And it changes all the time as the tide comes in and out it reveals a wholly different combination of, of blocks and shapes and shadows to work with. So you can actually spend a whole day working down there and, re and returning time and time again and not really repeat yourself. So these are charcoal on paper. And this is in a gallery in Dublin, the Rubicon Gallery. So yeah, there's the easel set up, and that's the landscape. So it's it's dramatic, uh, but you know, on a grey day, um, somebody might not really pay enough attention and, and miss it, you know, and that's what's one of the beauties of it, in a sense. Um, so this is a plein air painting that was on the easel actually as I was painting. 
more painted from the rocks by the coast. So these are all painted outdoors. I was getting better at it. You know, I kind of felt I was starting to get a grasp um, of, and also the weather, of course, was amazing at the time. So that helps enormously. You know, it's just the right conditions, you know. So one of these uh, paintings is in the uh, exhibition here. I think it's the center one. My next, my next show was in London, in the gallery I've been showing there since 1996. Um, place called Art First, contemporary art. And believe it or not, the works go down well there. Because uh, I suppose in a sense, uh, when peace broke out in Ireland, which happened in the mid 1990s, because of the, I mean, there was that terrible, what they euphemistically called the Troubles, in, in Ireland, um, uh, which was actually, uh, you know, s terrorism and bombs and numerous deaths and disappearing and kidnapping and all that stuff. That, that eventually all stopped and a uh, peace agreement was worked out. And Irish artists could once again be invited to show in London. And so, uh, because before then, it was very difficult to get a show or, or have your work even collected in London. So it opened up a whole market for a lot of Irish artists, again. Um, which was terrific. Uh, in 2006, or was it 2007? It's a six year, but I think. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> Memory. Um, I, was, uh, I was invited to go to the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation, which is in Connecticut. And uh, it was a very different type of environment to what I'd been used to. And it took me several, quite a, it took me a couple of weeks really to start finding a way to, to you know, um, access what was around me and make, make work based on it. So, um, one of the first things I did anyway was paint the studio, which was in the woods. So I made this series of paintings, which are just of the, the studio and the accommodation that I was living. It was a, it's a very remote um, place, a beautiful residency for artists uh, that are invited. There are only two artists there at any one time. I was there on my own, because the, uh, the other artist who was supposed to be there didn't show up. But, um, but so I had the woods to myself, and, um, and there's about a 75 acre wood, woodland that the, um, that the foundation is set in. And they, they are responsible for all of Joseph and Annie Albers archive. Um, so you could actually go into the archive, into the vault and take out Joseph Albers work, his drawings and, and Annie Albers prints and textiles and so on. And um, it was terrific. And uh, I eventually ended up doing quite a lot of work. Um, and again, this kind of series, you know, repeating, finding, finding associations or finding uh, uh, motifs that I could revisit. And my family came over as well um, for part of it. And we spent Christmas in Connecticut, which was uh, actually it was a real treat, you know. Uh, but also, um, on the same visit to the States, I made a trip to Philadelphia um, to visit Dolan Maxwell, to visit Margot and, and friends. I have here, Stuart Shills and uh, Randall, of course. So, um, and uh, the train, of course, in the mid midwinter, I just found amazing. The view out the window of that Amtrak was just, 
I, I couldn't believe it. So unfortunately, I didn't have a camera because I'd left the battery of my little camera back in the charger, you know. So, but I did have a Nokia, old-fashioned phone, which has a terrible camera on it. So I took pictures out the window, and they're terrible. And of course, they always were not the thing you actually intended to take because the lag, you know, the shutter lag. But anyway, I found, um, I found some very interesting stuff in between. So I, I saw a project in it and I felt I could make some paintings based on it. So, um, yeah, and some of you would probably recognize some of these places from the train. So, I, uh, but I thought I'd show them and show how sometimes the, the unexpected, you know, coughs up some, some interesting subject matter. Um, and these are all, these ones are all oil on canvas. And I made a lot of acrylic space in it too, which are more like studies, I suppose, going towards these. And I had a show then subsequently of these. So it was like two shows from the one residency, which is pretty spectacular, I think. I'm looking forward to seeing this building again. And uh, I think on the strength of my visit to Connecticut, I was invited then by a gentleman who was involved in the arts in County Court and was actually wanted to set up a residency program in his place, which is down here, or down in a wonderful area in, near McCroom in the center of County Cork in the south of the country. And this place is called the Gira, which is an Irish word meaning uh, flooded forest or flooded woodland. And, uh, and this place is like a, a delta, a river delta. Uh, it's ancient. It has an ancient oak forest. And um, in the 1950s, the, our electricity supply board um, turned this place into a reservoir. And they chopped down uh, lots of the oak trees and flooded the place. Which, of course, it caused an uh, equal amount of, um, well, it didn't cause, it, it caused, you know, a lot of uh, horror, I'd say, amongst a lot of people anyway, to have the uh, place devastated in such a way. But it's grown back, you know, and in the 1980s, it was turned into a nature reserve, designated a nature reserve. And when the water level is low, the old stumps of the trees um, appear, and it looks like a sort of a, an apocalyptic landscape so when you're down amongst it. Um, but, but it's a beautiful place. And, it's, uh, and so I, I was offered the opportunity to spend time there to see if it could work as a residency. The idea being that it wouldn't just be artists, but it would also be environmentalists and people studying botany and so on, because it, is, it has that richness and uh, wide ranging um, in area of interest. So uh, these are some of the works I made when I was there exploring this watery landscape. And uh, fortunately, there are hills on either side, steep hills, so it, it had a commanding view of the, uh, of the landscape. But down in the water, it, I found it quite fascinating. And the reason being was there was no obvious point of reference to make pictures of. You know, there wasn't any obvious iconic kind of structure you could say, right, okay, well, there's a painting right there. I really had to kind of explore and find my own way of interpreting what was there. Um, and, uh, and so eventually I did. I, I think gradually over the period of six weeks, started to find a way of, of, of I suppose, translating what was there. The one thing about this area in County Cork is that it's, it's not widely known as a place to visit. Uh, most visitors and tourists go to the west coast, around the coast actually, and go to the west Cork and so on. But in the, in the center of Cork, it's, it is just breathtakingly beautiful because of this type of, this type of um, landscape, the forest, the woodlands that kind of creep along the River Lee. Um, into mountainous regions.
Uh, this is one of the works in the exhibition. And I was also very interested in the, in the um, not just the, nat the landscape as nature uh, itself, but also the ho homesteads around it, the farms, the old barns and sheds. It all, to me, it's, uh, I kind of felt it was all part of, it was all part of, they all seemed to be threatened with flooding or something at some stage and somewhere. Um, but I love the, uh, the, old, uh, the old buildings around it. So this piece is in the show here as well. Uh, on another trip to West Cork, I spent some time uh, with a, in a friend's house in Glengariff in West Cork, and at the, which is at the edge of the Beira Peninsula, which is just one of those peninsulas in West Cork that, um, that uh, you know, people just love. I mean, it's a gorgeous place, understandably. But it, just behind it is this amazing valley called the Coomer Can Valley. And it has this reddish kind of uh, sandstone, I guess, hills around, and a very old oak forest. Um, and so I was very attracted to that. And I suppose it was, you kind of start to pick up the, the means and the tools of how to, how I felt anyway, how I could handle a landscape that wasn't seascapes or urban landscapes. And I was really interested in just exploring this place. So, um, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, there's, I suppose there's a lot of hit and miss. Oh, I lost uh, an image there. There's a lot of, um, a lot of failure comes with making these paintings too. But, but you have to sometimes fail to succeed, you know, make bad paintings to, to be able to make good paintings and so on. So, um, so uh, that kind of exploration is part of the, uh, part of the um, practice, I guess. So this is all the Coomer Cain Valley. Oh, making prints. So uh, another element that happened in the 2007 was my opportunity to make prints. Um, and uh, I started working with Stony Oro Press. And the idea being to translate a lot of these images or a, to take the ideas and make a series of carborundum prints. Um, carborundum being a, a type of printmaking, that's a carborundum plate. It's a type of printmaking that involves applying a paste mixed with this material, mi mineral called carborundum and, um, and creating a relief plate and then printing, inking it up and printing it. It's, uh, it's wonderful for painters to use. And so these are paintings, these are all four plate carborundum prints. And I'm gonna go fast through these because I know time is maybe running out. Kind of, um, this was a book, uh, this was a book project which I made. Um, and the idea was to create a book uh, of, of a sketchbook project really based on my drawings exploring Connemara in County Galway. Now Connemara is one of those landscapes that tourists love because it has an iconic beauty. It's got these amazing mountains. Um, and, but it also has this amazing bog called Randstone Bog. And, uh, and bo a bogland is just uh, an area of, 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 uh, that has accumulated over thousands, 10, 5,000 years maybe. And, um, and it, 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 you uh, can capture the light. It's like looking at the ocean, except it's land, you know. It's like looking at planes here, maybe, or something like that. But, uh, and this was the book that came out of that project. Another uh, residency I did was in, was in Paris. And this, of course, completely threw me off. But, um, <laughs> but, Par but I had a studio. It was a... a another residency that I uh, applied for and was successful in getting. And I just wanted to, uh, I wanted to explore the streets of Paris, like maybe Utrillo, Utrillo had done, you know, or, or you know, uh, I'm not sure, 
but exactly what I was expecting to do or get out of it. But uh, and this is the the Irish Cultural Centre in Paris, which is a place where you go if you want to discover or find out all things Irish. In and even have Guinness, you know, during the um, during the openings and and so on. There, it's a it's actually quite extraordinary place, really. And I was there for three months, and I explored the streets. Making paintings, the the very interesting thing about Paris is it's actually not colourful. It's the boulevards are all quite grey, you know. There's there's, there's colour you have to look for. Um, I was there when it was snowing again. Uh, it was February. It was there was a Siberian blast growing, you know, across the whole of northern Europe at that stage, and everything was frozen. But of course, it provided me at least with a subject matter, and a way in to this subject. But also the things like these bridges. And um, and the canals. Uh, uh, it was Canal of Saint Martin, which was uh, I had never seen before. And that's the detail of that painting. And so when I returned to Mayo, these guys were waiting for me, <laughs> welcoming me back, which was great. Um, and I made a series of paintings, you know, again. And I think the work evolves, you know. Even though I'm returning to the same place, I'm not making the same paintings, or at least they're, they're, they're happening in a different way. And uh, this painting is in the show. And um, just, you know, it was a great way just to, just to keep working, keep painting and responding. Diptychs on paper. This one is in the show. <coughs> the, uh, excuse me. This is, um, yes, this is the lighthouse at uh, Broadhaven, a place that I keep revisiting. And I, kinda, and I, I suddenly gave in. I decided I would um, start painting these big splashes. You know, they're omnipresent. They're there everywhere, you know, in, in Mayo. And... Uh, and I kind of felt there was something almost um, dreamlike almost about them, you know. And so I'm just going to finish up. I'm going to leave the last word to Seamus Heaney, Ireland's greatest poet, uh, after William Butler Yeats, probably. But maybe also, uh, in fact, he probably is. But he's the he's, uh, ability to capture in words what... Um, great painters can achieve is extraordinary. And this poem is one of my favourites. It's called The Peninsula. And uh, if you just listen to it or read the words when it comes up on screen, um, uh, you'll understand what I mean exactly. The Peninsula. When you have nothing more to say, just drive for a day all around the peninsula. The sky is tall as over a runway, the land without mark, so you will not arrive but pass through, though always skirting landfall. At dusk horizons drink down sea and hill, the ploughed field swallows the whitewashed gable, and you're in the dark again. Now recall the glazed foreshore and silhouetted log, that rock where breakers shredded into rags, the leggy birds stilted on their own legs, islands riding themselves out into the fog. And then drive back home, still with nothing to say, except that now you will uncode all landscapes by this. Things founded clean on their own shapes, water and ground in their extremity. Yeah, <clears throat> so thank you. That's, uh... Yeah.
Hello. Oops. Yeah, the early work um, was very much based on photography as a source of montage. Um, and in a way, it was about constructing images uh, and using um, <clears throat> my own fo photographs as a source. So looking all the time, but through a camera lens, and then back in the studio making drawings based on those. Um, and I think the transition happened at a point in the late 1980s when I was teaching, te doing a lot of teaching, teaching drawing. And when you're lecturing in art college and drawing, particularly it's life drawing, I, you learn a lot as well. You start to, you learn by proxy as you watch your students work. And it had, a, a, it had the knock-on effect of actually making it very difficult for me to go back and make the same work that I was making again. I, in fact, the work I continued to try and make, I was so dissatisfied with, I was having a crisis based on this was not working any longer, you know? And it was, it was one of those uh, insidious things that, that um, you know, it just wasn't happening. And so I felt I needed to find new means. And so I began working in charcoal. Unfortunately, I didn't show you any of those. I think I had them there, but I must have skipped them somewhere or other when they fold up, you know, on the... Uh, um, and the... Uh, it, so I started working in large blocks of charcoal set painters charcoal, so wedges of charcoal, and exploring landscape uh, tonally and in different ways. And so that, was, that acted as a transition in many ways. Um, and even things like illustrating children's books, the different uh, way of working brought out a very different um, a way of, of, uh, of seeing as well. So um, yeah. I found that I unlocked a certain, um, the secret, I suppose, that I was looking for to how to get back into painting again. Um, and when I started using, I, I didn't go back to painting using a brush. I started using anything but a brush. I was using cotton rags and um, sponges or, uh, you know, um, filling knives, anything like that. Nothing too small, and I was getting totally away from a, a small implement to try and work with great big sweeps of color and tone and work up the... Um, the so I actually became more interested in the uh, physical art of painting, the practice of painting, um, rather than trying to represent meticulously what was in front of me, but try and get a sense of the place through the painting. The painting became important, not not the subject matter in, in actual fact. Yeah, I think you might be right there, actually. There, there, is, a, there is a sort of connection, I think, um, timeline, certainly. Um, there was uh, the the the, the eight, 1980s were, were certainly kind of dark. Um, the trends at the time was towards new, new expressionism, um, much of it which I really didn't like 
and looking back, I don't think it was much very good either, but uh, I, a lot of it anyway. Um, and so uh, for me, it was a way of avoiding, you know, I, I, through 1980, certainly my, my work making pencil drawings in a way was by, it was, I felt that maybe I was uh, treading water or biding my time until I wanted to get back into painting. Um, and yes, when, when the commercial, when the, probably the gallery scene picked up enormously. Mind you, we always had great government support for the arts throughout the 1980s. So even though the, there was very little money around and people weren't necessarily buying a lot of art, the opportunities to show uh, were great because there was a, quite a lot of curated exhibitions, a lot of open submission exhibitions, um, government fundings, prizes, all that kind of stuff were, were there. So it was a very vibrant art scene. Um, and then the commercial scene took off in the 1990s and then kind of exploded in a frenzy in the 2000s um, and then died again in the 2010s. So, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What moved you to, to work that way? In the, terms of the surfaces. Well, it's a different. Well, the medium of paint, I suppose, uh, in a way, kind of changed, changes, and and the scale, of course, as well. So I think just the process of painting itself, um, uh, and time. So um, the sketchbook provides just just the skeleton of an idea. Really, and and spe specifying maybe the area of interest, but it w was not necessarily. It was only the starting point, we'll say. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned about uh, the advantage of acrylic paint over oil. Yeah. <clears throat> what kind of things you can do with acrylic paint harder with the oil? Well, it dries very quickly. Regular does anyway, and it's. Um, and so it was very useful, I found, for uh, plein air painting and, and going on residencies in particular. But also, uh, it's not toxic the way uh, solvents are. And um, it, I've, I'm afraid I'm, I have a lot of war wounds with solvents. And uh, so, um, so I, I try to, you know, I, I try to work outdoors when I'm painting in oils. But uh, acrylic, at least, it has... Uh, it has uh, flexibility. And I think I, once I had discovered a way of working with it that I was satisfied with, um, because it's very versatile medium. You can use it in watercolor, you can use it in, people use it in all manner of ways. Some people <coughs> abhor it because it's flat and stuff, but it's not, of course, so you can use it in many ways. So it's finding, it, it actually does um, uh, work very well in, in terms of recreating what I was trying to do with it anyway, certainly. Anybody else? Does it, well, a bad painting, whatever that might be, um, often is the basis of a, another painting, you know. So um, I usually set them aside and, and work over, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. Well, exactly. Yeah. Sometimes, I, unfortunately, I miss a good painting in the process of thinking it's a bad painting. So... Um, but that happens to all of us, you know. But uh, 
it's an ongoing process. You know, I don't even think of it as a bad painting. I, it's just some, something that doesn't quite hit the mark for me or I have to leave it aside and, uh, um, and revisit it. And uh, of course, revisiting anything usually means changing it entirely. So, um, so yeah. So maybe it's not wrong to say it's a bad painting. It's just a step on the way. Although occasionally, sorry, there are a few bad paintings. <laughs> now that I think about it. And ones I wish I never saw again, you know, but are out there. Or I maybe had second thoughts about, yeah. Yes? I like both. like both. Yeah. I think there's a place for um, solitude, you know, and, and certainly, I, uh, you know, I, a lot of my work gets done during that time. But I would be, you know, I'd go nuts in the woods, you know, if I was there on my own for long. You know, and I suppose at this point, I'd, I'd, I'd have to acknowledge the support that my family give me to allow me to go away, you know. And I think it's the same for all artists who have families, especially uh, a spouse, a partner, you know, it's, and you have children, you know, it's without that support, it's, um, it, could, it couldn't happen, you know. So uh, I think it's, you know, I, sa I stand here sort of saying how marvelous it's gone off in residences, but actually it comes at a, you know, it comes at a cost as well. And, and that cost is, is um, you know, can be, can be difficult, you know, sometimes, but but I'm very fortunate that my wife, Kim, is here. An amazing support, you know, been. so. Yes? <sighs> it kind of is, all right. You know, they're all, I think, I think it's all part of the fabric, really. Each series, some series more than others, I suppose. I mean, I, I love returning to Mayo. It's, it is my homeland, so, um, and I, you know, I've really enjoyed visiting the States and working uh, on those series in Vermont and, but you know, time kind of goes on and you kind of, you move on as well. So you're more, you know, the work you're doing now is nearly always the most important and favorite really. So um, I would say I'm here in Swarthmore and it's my favorite. <laughs> And my studio wall there is a testament to it, you know. So, but no, I, I, I like, you know, Paris was really intriguing.